Welcome to this edition of Journals of Spiritual Discovery, brought to you by spiritualteachers.org. I'm your host, Sean Nevins. Welcome to Journals of Spiritual Discovery. We're deep into the induction series now, in which my aim is to focus on inspired writings which carry a message beneath the words. Franklin Merrill Wolf called them mystic writings and said, When the voice of the silence speaks into the relative world, the meaning lies between the words, as it were, rather than in the direct content of the words themselves. Richard Rose referred to the power of these writings when he said, If you are interested in looking for essence from the point of the process observer, you can be stimulated only by writings of inspiration rather than reason or direction. He referred his students to the three books of the Absolute as an example. While Rose used the term inspirational, clearly these are not necessarily inspirational writings like you typically find collected under that banner. Rather, They are writings which carry the living word. My reading this episode is a poem from Walt Whitman's 1855 edition of Leaves of Grass. Whitman appeared in Richard Bucky's book Cosmic Consciousness, where he was compared to the likes of Jesus and the Buddha. It's clear that a spiritual awakening occurred for Whitman, but he himself said little about how it came about. Here's a few lines of Whitman speaking about what he discovered. There is, in sanest hours, a consciousness, a thought that rises independent, lifted out from all else, calm like the stars, shining eternal. This is the thought of identity, yours for you, whoever you are is mine for me. Miracle of miracles, beyond statement, most spiritual and vaguest of earth's dreams, yet hardest basic fact, and only entrance to all facts. In such devout hours, in the midst of the significant wonders of heaven and earth, significant only because of the me in the center, creeds, conventions fall away, and become of no account before this simple idea. Under the luminousness of real vision, it alone takes possession, takes value. Like the shadowy dwarf in the fable, once liberated and looked upon, it expands over the whole earth and spreads to the roof of heaven. With that said, let's move on to the poem which begins with the lines, To Think of Time. To think of time, to think through the retrospection, to think of today and the ages continued henceforward. Have you guessed you yourself would not continue? Have you dreaded those earth beetles? Have you feared the future would be nothing to you? Is today nothing? Is the beginningless past nothing? If the future is nothing, they are just as surely nothing. To think that the sun rose in the east, that men and women were flexible and real and alive, that everything was real and alive. To think that you and I did not see, feel, think, nor bear our part, to think that we are now here and bear our part. Not a day passes, not a minute or second without an accouchement. Not a day passes, not a minute or second without a corpse. When the dull nights are over and the dull days also, when the soreness of lying so much in bed is over, when the physician, after long putting off, gives silent and terrible look for an answer, 
And the children come hurried and weeping, and the brothers and sisters have been sent for. When medicines stand unused on the shelf, and the camphor smell has pervaded the rooms, when the faithful hand of the living does not desert the hand of the dying, when the twitching lips press lightly on the forehead of the dying, when the breath ceases and the pulse of the heart ceases, then the corpse limbs stretch on the bed and the living look upon them. They are palpable as the living are palpable. The living look upon the corpse with their eyesight, but without eyesight lingers a different living and looks curiously on the corpse, to think that the rivers will come to flow, and the snow fall, and fruits ripen, and act upon others as upon us now, yet not act upon us. To think of all these wonders of city and country, and others taking great interest in them, and we are taking small interest in them. To think how eager we are in building our houses. To think others shall be just as eager, and we quite indifferent. I see one building the house that serves him a few years, or seventy or eighty years at most. I see one building the house that serves him longer than that. Slow moving and black lines creep over the whole earth. They never cease. They are the burial lines. He that was president was buried, and he that is now president shall surely be buried. Cold dash of waves at the ferry wharf, posh and ice in the river, half-frozen mud in the streets, a gray discouraged sky overhead, the short last daylight of December a hearse and stages, other vehicles give place, the funeral of an old stage driver, a cortege mostly drivers, rapid the trot to the cemetery, duly rattles the death bell, the gate is passed, the grave is halted at, the living alight, the hearse uncloses, the coffin is lowered and settled, the whip is laid on the coffin, the earth is swiftly shoveled in. A minute. No one moves or speaks. It is done. He is decently put away. Is there anything more? He was a good fellow, free-mouthed, quick-tempered, not bad-looking, able to take his own part, witty, sensitive to a slight, ready with life or death for a friend, fond of women, played some ate hearty, drank hearty, had known what it was to be flush, grew low-spirited towards the last, sickened, was helped by a contribution, died aged forty-one years, and that was his funeral. Thumb extended or finger uplifted, apron, cape, gloves, strap, wet weather clothes, whip carefully chosen, Boss, spotter, starter, and hostler. Somebody loafing on you, or you loafing on somebody. Headway. Man before and man behind. Good day's work or bad day's work. Pet stock or mean stock. First out or last out. Turning in at night. To think that these are so much and so nigh to other drivers and he there takes no interest in them. The markets, the government, the working man's wages, to think what a count they are through our nights and days. To think that other working men will make just as great account of them, yet we make little or no account. The vulgar and the refined what you call sin and what you call goodness, to think how wide a difference, to think the difference will still continue to others, yet we lie beyond the difference, to think how much pleasure there is, 
Have you pleasure from looking at the sky? Have you pleasure from poems? Do you enjoy yourself in the city or engaged in business or planning a nomination and election or with your wife and family or with your mother and sisters or in womanly housework or the beautiful maternal cares? These also flow onward to others. You and I flow onward. But in due time, you and I shall take less interest in them. Your farm and profits and crops, to think how engrossed you are, to think there will still be farms and profits and crops, yet for you of what avail? What will be, will be well. For what is, is well. To take interest is well, and not to take interest shall be well. The sky continues beautiful. The pleasure of men with women shall never be sated, nor the pleasure of women with men, nor the pleasure from poems. Domestic joys, the daily housework or business, the building of houses, they are not phantasms. They have weight and form and location. The farms and profits and crops, the markets and wages and government, they also are not phantasms. The difference between sin and goodness is no apparition. The earth is not an echo. Man and his life and all the things of his life are well considered. You are not thrown to the winds. You gather certainly and safely around yourself. Yourself, yourself, yourself forever and ever. It is not to diffuse you that you were born of your mother and father. It is to identify you. It is not that you should be undecided, but that you should be decided Something long preparing and formless is arrived and formed in you. You are thenceforth secure, whatever comes or goes. The threads that were spun are gathered. The weft crosses the warp. The pattern is systematic. The preparations have every one been justified. The orchestra have tuned their instruments sufficiently. The baton has given the signal. The guest that was coming, he waited long for reasons. He is now housed. He is one of those who are beautiful and happy. He is one of those that to look upon and be with is enough. The law of the past cannot be eluded. The law of the present and future cannot be eluded. The law of the living cannot be eluded. It is eternal. The law of promotion and transformation cannot be eluded. The law of heroes and good doers cannot be eluded. The law of drunkards and informers and mean persons cannot be eluded. Slow moving and black lines go ceaselessly over the earth. Northerner goes carried, and Southerner goes carried, and they on the Atlantic side, and they on the Pacific, and they between, and all through the Mississippi country, and all over the earth. The great masters and cosmos are well as they go. The heroes and good doers are well. The known leaders and inventors and the rich owners and pious and distinguished may be well, but there is more account than that. There is strict account of all. The interminable hordes of the ignorant and wicked are not nothing. The barbarians of Africa and Asia are not nothing. The common people of Europe are not nothing. The American Aborigines are not nothing. A Zambo or a four-headless crowfoot or a Comanche is not nothing. 
The infected in the immigrant hospital are not nothing. The murderer or mean person is not nothing. The perpetual succession of shallow people are not nothing as they go. The prostitute is not nothing. The mocker of religion is not nothing as he goes. I shall go with the rest. We have satisfaction. I have dreamed that we are not to be changed so much, nor the law of us changed. I have dreamed that heroes and good doers shall be under the present and past law, and that murderers and drunkards and liars shall be under the present and past law. For I have dreamed that the law they are under now is enough, and I have dreamed that the satisfaction is not so much changed, and that there is no life without satisfaction. What is the earth? What are body and soul without satisfaction? I shall go with the rest. We cannot be stopped at a given point. That is no satisfaction. To show us a good thing, or a few good things for a space of time, that is no satisfaction. We must have the indestructible breed of the best, regardless of time. If otherwise all these things came but to ashes of dung, if maggots and rats ended us, then suspicion and treachery and death. Do you suspect death? If I were to suspect death, I should die now. Do you think I could walk pleasantly and well-suited toward annihilation? Pleasantly and well-suited I walk. Whither I walk I cannot define, but I know it is good. The whole universe indicates that it is good. The past and the present indicate that it is good. How beautiful and perfect are the animals. How perfect is my soul. How perfect the earth and the minutest thing upon it. What is called good is perfect, and what is called sin is just as perfect. The vegetables and minerals are all perfect, and the imponderable fluids are perfect. Slowly and surely they have passed on to this and slowly and surely they will yet pass on. O oh, my soul, if I realize you I have satisfaction. Animals and vegetables, if I realize you I have satisfaction. Laws of the earth and air, if I realize you I have satisfaction. I cannot define my satisfaction, yet it is so. I cannot define my life, yet it is so. I swear, I see now that every living thing has an eternal soul. The trees have, rooted in the ground. The weeds of the sea have, the animals. I swear, I think, there is nothing but immortality, that the exquisite scheme is for it and the nebulous float is for it, and the cohering is for it, and all preparation is for it, and identity is for it, and life and death are for it. Thank you for listening. I do have one special request during the induction series. And no, I'm not going to ask you to buy anything, but I am asking all my listeners to please leave a review on Amazon for my book, Subtraction, The Simple Math of Enlightenment. I know that a lot of you have read it, and if we can get 100 reviews on Amazon, I'm told that will really help the book stand out and get noticed. So if you enjoyed Subtraction, please go to Amazon.com, type in subtraction, the simple math of enlightenment, and leave a review. It only takes a few minutes, and you'll help many other seekers simply by giving your thoughts about the book. 
You don't have to have purchased the book on Amazon in order to leave a review there. So thanks. I hope you can do that for me. And I will see you again on the next episode.